Good evening. Thank you for joining us for tonight's lecture. I'm Patrick Lewis, Director of Collections and Research at the Filson Historical Society. Thank you again for joining us for tonight's lecture on the book, Our Rightful Place, A History of Women at the University of Kentucky, 1880 to 1945, published by the University Press of Kentucky. It is my honor to introduce tonight's speakers. Terry Berry Birdwhistle is Senior Oral Historian and Founding Director of the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History at the University of Kentucky Libraries. He's former president of the Oral History Association and previously served as Dean of Libraries at UK. He's contributed to numerous collections, including the Encyclopedia of Louisville and the Encyclopedia of Kentucky. His articles have appeared in publications such as Kentucky Law Journal, the Register of the Kentucky Historical Society, and the Kentucky Review. Deirdre Skaggs is Associate Dean of the University of Kentucky Libraries Special Collections Research Center. She also serves as Director of the Wendell H. Ford Public Policy Research Center. She's the author of Women in Lexington and co-author of The Historic Kentucky Kitchen, Traditional Recipes for Today's Cook. I will return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. Please join me in welcoming tonight's speakers. Hello, everyone. This is Deirdre. I just wanted to uh, take a moment to thank the Filson Club on behalf of Terry Birdwhistle and myself for having us um, in to do this talk via Zoom today. And I wanna thank all of you for coming. I look forward to sharing stories with you um, and answering your questions at the end of our presentation. Terry, if you wouldn't mind going ahead to share our screen, I will go ahead and get started with our talk. Perfect. So I wanted to say just a little bit about how this project started. Terry Birdwhistle chose to write his dissertation on the history of women at UK. And that was a project that I think was really ahead of its time. The research demand in the roles and history of women was not as prevalent as it is today. And when Terry approached me about working on the book manuscript with him to turn it into a fully formed um, book for publication, I was thrilled and, and honored that he wanted me to be a part of this process. And so Terry brought the lens of a historian to the project and his expertise in oral history. I brought my perspective as a woman, um, as someone who studies women's history, but also my belief that images can more completely tell a story. As a photographer myself and a scholar of photographic history, I believe strongly in their value as an information resource. And photographs allow us to examine, to see, and to put ourselves more completely into the past. It was really important to me from that perspective that these photographs really help paint a picture for the reader um, and that they did not serve as just mere illustrations for the text. And this endeavor took a number of years and went through so many iterations. And I just have to acknowledge that books like this, when you see them at the end, it's truly a labor of love that keeps you going. The history of women at UK and in higher education in general is a complex and compelling story and much still remains to be studied, not only in these early years leading up to World War II, but the years going through integration, the women's rights movement into the present times. Terry and I use the vast archival resources in the UK Library's Special Collections Research Center and the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History to write this book and its, its success is a testament to the richness of these collections. Um, I also think that um, it demonstrates how important primary sources are and how important it is to preserve our history. So today, as I said, we are going to share some of those stories from our rightful place with you. When women were first admitted to UK in 1880, there were only a few campus buildings. There was a men's dorm, the main building which served as a classroom, and the president's home. Men dominated the campus and they were known to be a pretty rough lot. Um, they were rowdy, and the relationship between UK and the city was tenuous based on their antics. Like many other newly co-educational colleges in the US, the first women students at UK found an environment uh, completely controlled by men. The faculty were all male, the administration were all um, men, and certainly the campus was dominated by male students. 
The students on campus during the time, the male students, wore military-style cadet uniforms. They participated in daily drill exercises in front of the main building, and they carried firearms on campus. So I can only imagine how daunting this military, this really formal and structured military-like environment must have seen to the women who were coming to campus for the first time. Um, a theme that I hope appears to you all throughout our rightful place is that despite how unwelcoming this may have felt, women rose to the challenge and in this example uh, formed what they called the Broom Brigade, which is pictured here. And so this, um, this picture demonstrates this group that they formed that mimicked the structure and the purpose of the men's military drills. And they found a way to sort of make a point about that um, and make it their own and make a place for themselves very early on in UK's history. Campus administrators were very concerned about keeping uh, the male and female students separate. So much so that in 1888, they hired, the college hired Lucy Barry Blackburn, pictured here, to watch over the women students while they were on campus. So, you know, women couldn't just walk around and gather and socialize while they were on campus. They had to gather together in a room in the main building between classes. Uh, Gertrude Renz Gordon, who was a member of the class of 1904, remembered that Lucy Berry Blackburn tried her best to keep her young ladies in the assembly room from looking out and flirting with the young gentlemen on the campus. So even though the men students could have firearms in their dorm room, um, women's students had to sign a pledge that they wouldn't use tobacco or profane language while on the campus. All the students, both men and women, did make fun of uh, Blackburn and her rules. And one, should, one could speculate that there may have been real concern about the safety of the women's students on campus and not necessarily their morality. Um, but I think there's some fine lines between those two and those lines um, are blurred throughout this history. And they were in fact on campus with very few other women. And as I said, the antics of the men uh, were very rowdy during the time. Eight years after women were admitted to UK, the first woman earned her degree on June 4th, 1888. And as the college faculty reviewed the candidates for degrees, they concluded that cadets George Bryan, Henry Curtis, Robert Payne, Fred Bartlett, and Miss Arabella Clement Gunn had creditably finished the course prescribed for the degree of Bachelor of Science. So at 19 years of age, Belle Gunn became the first woman student at UK to earn a baccalaureate degree. But before the 1888 commencement, President Patterson called Belle Gunn to his office to suggest that she might not want to sit up on the platform with the men on commencement day. And to this Gunn replied, I've been through four years in classes with them and I don't see why I shouldn't sit on the platform with them now. And at commencement, the president referred to Gunn as the eldest daughter of the institution. Throughout the late 1800s, campus administrators continued to worry about the ability of men and women to exist, to coexist, excuse me, on campus. During an inspection of the campus grounds in 1897, uh, a board of trustees appointed committee found the mingling of the sexes and expressions of companionship which they believed to be inappropriate. They specifically cited an instance when a male and a female student were actually using the same book and not giving their full attention to the teacher. As a result of this, the committee recommended that the desks of men and women students be placed on opposite sides of the classroom. Furthering the spirit of keeping campus separate, the university hired Florence Offit Stout, who you see here, as the assistant physical director of the gymnasium in charge of women's instruction. She had a salary of $800 per year. Um, six months prior to this, President Patterson told Stout, no vacancy existed or would exist for a woman director, but uh, minds change as time continues. 
A note that I love to point out, even though I am a fan of UK men's basketball, women's basketball was established on campus in 1902, making their 1902-1903 women's basketball team the first at the then called State College to play a full intercollegiate schedule. So women's basketball was started before men's at UK. The sport was taken really seriously by the women themselves, but not by their male counterparts. According to Hale, Kentucky by Helen Dice Irvin, a Kentuckian of 1904, Kentuckian was um, the yearbook, reports a game as one vast tide of straight hair, stray hair, curls and ribbons reversed. And so for the first few years, the women's basketball team mostly played interclass scrimmages um, they only played one or two true intercollegiate games per season, and these games were carefully monitored by Florence Offutt Stout. No spectators were allowed. And part of this was because Stout believed in medical gymnastics, and this was a more gentle form of physical exercise that was targeted at promoting physical health and eliminating obesity. So competitive sports was really at odds with this program that she believed in. In 1909, the women's basketball team complained via petition to the faculty senate that stated that Stout did not support the development of the sport and asked that the athletic association take over the management of the team. And this started a power struggle which stretched over almost two decades um, among Stout, women students who were in favor of the sport and the actual athletic association. So pictured here is Patterson Hall and women had been attending classes for 24 years at UK before they had a place to live on the university's campus. And even then when Patterson Hall did finally open in 1904, it became the first college building that was constructed apart from the central core of the original campus. And this was just north of campus at the time. If you're familiar with Lexington, um, that's now Euclid Avenue or Avenue of Champions, but was then known as, when, known as Winslow Street. And so even though, even the legislature seemed to want men and women students to remain as separate as possible, because it was the legislature that stipulated that the dormitory could not be constructed on the, exi on the existing campus. So that's why they had to build it over there. And its location really reinforced this prevailing separation of women students, both physically and intellectually. And so at the time, it was a fairly long walk from Patterson Hall. They had to cross this main thoroughfare, Winslow Street, and then over a bridge that spanned a body of water fed by a natural spring in the area, and then up the hill to the main, main campus where classes were held. So undoubtedly, those legislatures who uh, only a few years earlier were worried about men and women students um, sitting next to one another in classes were very worried about them sleeping too close to one another as well. But despite these separations, women began making their way into traditionally male dominated, dominated majors. Margaret Ingalls um, made history in 1916 when she became the first woman to graduate from UK with a degree in me mechanical engineering. The Kentucky Alumnus Magazine reported that Miss Ingalls completed the entire four years of the course, taking her turns in the Ford shops and machine shop and doing the other duties of the engineer, while the rest of the boys never shirking a duty, however irksome. I should note that Margaret Ingalls is the, uh, the cover of our book, and that's her at the forge in that image. And when asked by a reporter whether she reported women's suffrage, Ingalls responded, well, yes, don't you? Um, nevertheless, the reporter felt compelled to conclude that Ingalls seemed too absorbed in her work to worry about votes for women. Um, I've brought you through this first portion of our text, and now I am happy to turn over the rest to Terry Birdwhistle, and I will join you all again for questions at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deirdre. <clears throat> and I want to thank, also thank the Filson Society for having us uh, here this evening. As uh, uh, Deirdre has uh, described, the first generations of women students were truly pioneers. 
They were seeking entrance into a public college. But in the years leading up to World War I, the lives of women on the UK campus began to evolve. And much of the, uh, hang on just a second, much of the change uh, can be attributed to this person right here, Frances Jewell. Frances Jewell grew up in her family's home on Lexington's Ashland Avenue on the Near East Side, and she attended Sayre School. She spent her high school years at a boarding school, the Baldwin School, outside Philadelphia. In 1913, she graduated from Vassar College with a degree in English. Frances Jewell joined the English faculty at UK two years later in 1915, and then served as Dean of Women from 1921 to 1923. She introduced to the campus the same type of women's culture that she had experienced and enjoyed so much at Vassar. She promoted women's clubs and social activities in addition to just academics. She wanted to create more space and more places for women to interact. Frances was born to a privileged class, but she acquired a compassion for uh, the less fortunate. And naturally extroverted and socially graceful, she sympathized with those more awkward in such environments. A proponent of women's rights, she experienced and sometimes accepted the limitations created by the sexism of her generation. A romantic for the old South, she supported improved race relations and better education for African-Americans. Entering UK in 1914, Austin Lilly intended to major in chemistry, but a friend influenced her to major in home economics instead, one of the fastest growing departments at the university. Still, her home economics major required that she complete four years of chemistry alongside mostly male students. She told me in an oral history interview, some of us girls were better students than some of the boys in chemistry. We weren't taking a back seat. Involved in women's suffrage, Lily truly believed that women were well on their way at the time she was in college to equality within the American society. As a teacher, Frances Jewell made a lasting impression on Austin Lilly. Lilly vividly recalled Jewell's sophomore English class. She remembered Jewell's classes as jovial and that Jewell regularly posed questions to the class that brought out a whole lot of things other than just about English. She encouraged students to express their thoughts and feelings. She was just an excellent person who everybody liked and got to know as a person. Austin Lilly never married and spent her career teaching at the high school and college level. When asked on a 1938 UK alumni questionnaire to give the full name of her husband or wife, Austin Lilly wrote in very large letters across the entire page, neither nor. UK President Frank McVeigh's first wife, Mabel Sawyer McVeigh, died in 1922 after a brief illness. A year later, the Dean of Women, Francis Jewell, who was only 32, and the university president, Frank McVeigh, who was 52 with grown children, began an intense romantic relationship. They married in November, 1923. Unfortunately, like most women of her generation and social class, marrying McVeigh meant giving up her paid professional career. During their courtship, Francis and Frank exchanged some extraordinary love letters. In the letters, Frank tried valiantly, and I suppose successfully, to convince Francis that being an unpaid president's wife was better than a career as a professor and university administrator. In her letters to Frank, Frances seemed to want marriage, a family, and a career. But in 1924, 
that was seldom possible for a woman in her social class. Here you see France and France, Francis and Frank McVeigh with Sir William Leslie McKenzie and Lady McKenzie at Maxwell Place, the president's home, in 1935. Frank is on the bottom left and Francis at top right. Francis put Maxwell Place at the center of the Lexington social scene, entertaining Eleanor Roosevelt and many other distinguished visitors, as well as hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of UK students and faculty during the years she was there. She became a wonderful ambassador for UK across the Commonwealth. Sarah Blanding seen here met Francis Jewell in the fall of 1919 while registering for an English class. Each made an impression on the other almost instantly. Blanding became Jewell's protege, which prepared her to become Dean of Women in 1923 after Francis got married and Blanding was only 24 years old at the time. The time between World War I and World War II brought the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression, and the New College Woman. It became a time when UK had to adjust to a rapidly changing student culture, and one that included a push for more freedom for women, an ongoing theme throughout the history of women at UK. Even though Francis Jewel McVeigh influenced Blanding tremendously, Blanding, not surprisingly really, functioned much differently as Dean in a post-suffrage, flapper-influenced, and subsequently Depression-era environment. Whereas Jewell had been a catalyst for the expansion of women's organizations and activities, Blanding ultimately became the prototypical Dean of women familiar to most college students through the 1960s, the strict disciplinarian and the guardian of the women students and their reputations. Dean Blanding inherited responsibility for women students who were really unlike any before. And in fact, there were many more of them. During the course of the 1920s, women's numbers nearly tripled at the University of Kentucky and their percentage of the total student population increased by nearly 10%. Those post war I women students differed from their predecessors in very significant ways. They had access to cars, cigarettes, and alcohol. They liked to dance. <clears throat> and in their evenings, with a late night automobile ride and intimate moments, they talked more and more openly about their relationships with men and became intent on reshaping student culture and their own futures. Universities across the country witnessed the appearance of college women and men who were more likely to be members of fraternities and sororities and who became immersed in the world of campus social activities. The automobile meant more freedom and more concern on the part of the administration. Historian Beth Bailey noted that the automobile took courting from the parlor and front porches of homes and dormitories to the back seat of automobiles, giving women students immense freedom from the university's strict supervision. Here's one student's poem about cars. And there are several other poems in our book that talk about marriage and uh, the various aspects of women's life, lives generally. And this is just uh, two lines from the from the point that I really like. My automobile is a jailer's key, unlocking my chains and setting me free. As a new Dean of Women, Sarah Blanding found herself in the middle of an ongoing debate regarding women's basketball. Deirdre talked about the early years of women's basketball and the debate was who was gonna be in charge of it. Well, this debate was about the future of intercollegiate competition on the part of the women's basketball team. 
And that competition ended in 1924. Blanding's role in the ban in banning women's basketball might seem odd for someone who had only the year before had captained a championship basketball team for the university. She was the leading scorer. But Florence Office Stout, who Deirdre mentioned, and Francis and Frank McVeigh all favored abolishing intercollegiate women's sports. By going along with the demise of women's basketball, Blanding appeased her physical education colleague, her mentor, Francis, and her president. But by doing so, she helped to set back the development of intercollegiate women's basketball that would not be reinstituted at the University of Kentucky for another four decades. And so instead of intercollegiate athletics, here you see the women students representing many different sports and the university would establish play days so that the women could travel to the University of Cincinnati or other nearby schools in the region to uh, participate in sporting activities uh, for a day. One of the reasons that Frances Jewell opposed intercollegiate basketball for women was she thought it restricted the number of women who had an opportunity to play. Frances was all about all women being involved in all the activities. And so by doing this, she thought that this gave more women an opportunity to participate in athletics. And in fact, it did. But uh, at that time, they did not foresee the tremendous growth in intercollegiate athletics that, would, that we see today. While the 1920s produced no large scale expansion of women's separate organizations, one development during the decade warranted special attention. Because the university band grew out of the all male cadet corps, it remained an all male band after women started attending the UK. In the spring of 1927, UK band director Elmer Sulcer organized an all women's band. And here you see them in this photo. Writing in the student newspaper, Catherine Best noted, the only requirements for membership in the women's band are a speaking acquaintance with music and the rather restricted quality of being a girl. Therefore, if your mama calls your daughter and you can read music, report to practice Tuesday, state your preference for it, instruments, and automatically become a member. 45 women immediately signed on. During the 1930s, women's enrollment continued to increase at the university, but women's percentage of the total enrollment declined. By the fall of 1932, roughly 38% of the UK women students earned either all or part of their living expenses through jobs arranged by the Dean of Women's Office. Those jobs included waiting tables, living with families in the community and caring for their children and doing housework and general secretarial work primarily on the campus. More harmful than economic conditions in some ways were the negative comments and actions toward women that seemed to increase during the 1930s. You can see those comments uh, in the uh, student newspaper and other, uh, and other places. And even some of the male professors on campus continued exhibiting real hostility toward women students. And this was in the 1930s. A male law student remembered his fellow law student, Mildred Robards, as, quote, a mighty nice little lady whom a law professor was always trying to embarrass and did embarrass her a lot. He added that every time the professor introduced an ugly rape case or 
really any case that involves sex, he always called on Miss Robards, the only woman in the class, of course. One day, Robards turned the tables on the law professor, and I will encourage you to read our book about that particular incident. But Robards uh, went on to receive her law degree, apparently never married, and worked most of her career for the Social Security Administration in Philadelphia. The World War II years at UK are most often remembered as a time when women took over the campus as all of the men left for war. This image in the 1944 Kentuckian represented that prevailing view that women were holding up the university during the war, putting it literally on their shoulders. Women supposedly were in charge of everything. Women were allowed to participate in the university's band during the Second World War. The university hired more women instructors. It seemed like a thought of a new age for women. Women students took over student government, the student newspaper, the Colonel, the yearbook, the Kentuckian, but it was only for the duration of the war. In many ways, it was really an illusion of equality. So, so wait, who are, who are all these men? Who, there aren't supposed to be any men on campus. And this is a photo of a group of soldiers in front of a Funkhauser building at the University of Kentucky during the Second World War. Well, at times, over 1,000 soldiers studied and trained at UK during the war. Lillian Terry, a UK student during that time, told me in an oral history interview that after the soldiers arrived, the campus blossomed out. Quote, you could choose any boy you wanted. Oh, good gracious. In the student center, we would be surrounded by GIs. It was like heaven on earth to a girl who hadn't had that many dates up to then. In 1944, Betty Tevis was featured in the Louisville Career Journal as the first woman ever to be allowed into Adolph Rupp's basketball dressing room to interview the players. She had become the first sports, woman sports editor of the student newspaper. However, Tevis told me years later that the entire episode was staged by UK Public Relations. They took her down to an empty dressing room and then brought in one of the players to sit with her for the photographs. Tevis told me that she went along with it because as she said, I didn't have sense enough at the time to say you're not going to exploit me in this way. Well, Dean of Women, Sarah Holmes, was not happy about this when she learned of it and called Tevis into her office very upset until Tevis explained what had really happened. Sarah Holmes on the left and women students in their room in 1944. Again, the photo on the right is probably stays. Uh, the woman student lying down, writing a letter, I suppose, to her boyfriend with his photograph in front of her. Uh, another student sitting at the desk, smoking a cigarette, the third student reading. Actually, during World War II, women were moved out of their dormitories and, in, and into men's fraternity houses to make room for those soldiers we saw earlier who came to campus and took over Patterson Hall and most of the other women's residence halls. Then after the war, the returning male veterans created 
a tremendous housing shortage on campus. And there was a growing concern that women's enrollment would be limited to accommodate the returning men. Dean Holmes warned UK officials that the university should not house returning male veterans at the expense of women's students. Writing in 1946, she noted, I could not help but wonder if the doors are closing for women students at our co-educational institutions. It is a short-sighted policy to provide educational benefits for veterans at the expense of women. We hear a lot today about when will we be able to return to some sense of normalcy. And that, of course, was the same language used after World War II. Well, returning to normalcy at, World, at UK meant that women's leadership roles on campus were systematically reversed. And as I mentioned, adequate campus housing restricted women's enrollment. Women faculty who had been hired to teach during the war were let go. The university ban returned to only male members. And men again dominated the Kentucky Colonel, the Kentuckian, and student government. Francis Jewel McVeigh died June 13, 1945, after a long struggle with lung cancer. As Francis's life ended, so too did the Second World War. In less than a year, her protege, Sarah Blanding, would be named the first woman president of Vassar College. Francis would have been thrilled. Francis, Jewel McVeigh's life in so many ways framed this story for Deirdre and me. A remarkable woman by any measure. She continues to this day to be celebrated and remains one of the most often remembered and most beloved women in the over 150 year history of the University of Kentucky. Francis vividly represented the possibilities the contradictions, the successes, and the failures that UK women confronted during their first seven decades on the campus. She arrived at UK at a time when women's hopes had never been more promising. Yet when Francis died that summer in 1945, many challenges remained regarding women's struggle for equality of opportunity. The modern women's movement remained mostly hidden below the horizon. Only Sarah Holmes and a few women colleagues stood as strong voices against the movement to educate men at the expense of women. Gaining access to UK in 1880 was just the beginning of a long and continuing struggle. Since then, women's academic descendants have pushed, prodded, argued, cajoled, and even threatened as they have sought to gain their rightful place within the University of Kentucky. And I wanna thank you for joining us tonight for this and we look forward to questions and comments. And uh, this is a code for, uh, if you purchase our book through the University Press of Kentucky, Use the code FA20 for a 20% book discount. So thank you very much. Well, thank you both. That was that was really fantastic and, and raised all kinds of questions. Uh, I've got a few that I want to, to make sure we, we ask. Uh, if our audience has any, they can put them into the, the chat. I'd also remind everyone that there is a, a donation link um, there if you wanted to support the Filson. And of course, uh, thank you all for that discount code for uh, UPK. We all want to support uh, good scholarship um, of uh, this Commonwealth. 
Um, I wanted to go back to something that Deirdre mentioned very early on about uh, the photographs here not being mere illustrations, but as, as really vital uh, pieces of the, the scholarship and the story that you all were telling here. Uh, I wonder if you talk, uh, and this is a question for both of you really, about um, you know, the ways that you use photographs and the challenges in finding these within these collections, given that some of them are staged and, and how that, that, that makes you have to, to think about representation and, and the real story going on behind the picture. Thanks, Patrick. I'll start off anyway. Um, you know, I think I made my position, of course, clear very early on, but, you know, when you're doing photographic research, you certainly have to to think about all of those things, you know, what was the intent or bias of the photographer, you know, whether or not they've been hired to, to do something specifically. Um, you know, this happens, I think a, a great example, although this is outside the, the scope of this book is um, images that were commissioned for coal mining towns to show how happy everyone was and well fed the workers were and photographers came in with these completely staged family meal scenes where everyone was dressed in their best and, and things like that. And so it was really important for me to try and find photographs that um, were included in collections that represented women when they were students. So they were their personal photographs, you know? So these were certainly taken from that perspective and shows the perspective of that individual amateur photographer. Um, and, you know, with some of the others, you do have to, to keep that in mind that they're setting a, a, a stage to tell a story for a publication, probably for, um, you know, marketing purposes for the university. And so to do that in a way that the photos help provide that historical context requires a lot of critical looking at the photographs and thinking of all of those those things in mind and you know of course you're working with the availability of the um, resources and collections that we have you know and so so much is dependent upon that and um, we both Terry and I worked really hard in reviewing the photographs and selecting them and really thinking about the key aspects of being able to show the reader through these photographs, you know, what, not only what it looked like, but how that must have felt like, you know, the emotions that that would convey to um, the students who were on campus during any particular time. And um, I hope that that's been successful throughout the book, but it's something that I worked, you know, really hard to try. And, and also, you know, the practicalities of publishing a book is that photographs are expensive to reproduce in publications and you know we're working with an academic press and you know we're not in this for for the profit and so you have to balance all of those things from a practical perspective but also making sure that you you're not taking away from that original intent and you know i think when you see the you know, the, the Broom Brigade um, is a great example, but there's a lot of other photographs that you really can see the disparity between men and women on campus. And, you know, it, it's the visual impact is strong from that perspective. And so I think that that's another way um, that throughout the book, we've been able to do, to do that, to just visually show the disparity. Yeah, I would add that, uh... You know, Deirdre played such a crucial role in the, the publication with those visual <clears throat> images. But in her in her day job, you know, she's been mostly responsible for uh, digitizing and getting access to those photographs. And people can now go on to uh, the website for the Special Collections Research Center and and find a lot of those uh, find a lot of those photographs. And and uh, it it really was a I'll, I'll just add that it really was a struggle to pick the images and did her pick them so I, you know, because she has the better sense of that. But, uh, you know, there's so many uh, photographs and uh, she said this, you can only put so many in that book. So I encourage people to go, go on our website and look at it, Explore UK. I'll vouch for the quality of, of Explore UK. You, you can really find just about anything from any era of the university's history. 
Um, it's, it's absolutely stunning. Yes, thank you for putting that in the chat. Um, I wanted to, to ask, Terry, you mentioned a couple of oral histories with some of these, these former students. I wonder if you could talk about um, that work and, and, and maybe UK's uh, important role in oral history more generally. Well, the, the Lupin Center for Oral History has well over 10,000 interviews now. And uh, one of the areas uh, that I've been really interested in over the years in building up the collection is on the history of, of UK. So uh, I think the uh, earliest uh, person I interviewed uh, was a, like a 1902 graduate. Uh, for, this, for this work, the only frustration was not being able to interview more people. You know, uh, the quotes I use from the people I was able to interview are very poignant and help understand what was going on. As, as, as Darren was saying about the photographs, we have to know what's going on. And then we had a person who was in the photograph tell us that's what, this is what really happened. You know, it wasn't that, it was this. And, and, uh, and Austin Lilly, you know, talk, from those early days, uh, the, the earliest person I interviewed uh, turned out to be a 1913 graduate of, of UK. And I was doing these interviews in the uh, 80s and 90s. And uh, uh, just as an aside, uh, I was interviewing her in Corbin, Kentucky, because we were doing a project on former Governor Happy Chandler. And you won't believe this, she was Happy Chandler's high school teacher. And so I went down to Corbin. And I was interviewing her about uh, Happy Chandler and learned that she was a UK graduate. So after I finished the interview about Happy Chandler, I said, do you mind if we do another interview? And so I interviewed her about her time at, at UK. And she told me some fascinating stories. Her name was Rexy Raymond. And she told me just fascinating stories. And so, you know, it's great to have these uh, interviews. They were really helpful to us in putting this book together. Uh, frustrating that we don't have more. And then what I keep thinking about is how are we going in going forward? How are we going to continue to interview women who were at UK in the 50s and 60s and 70s during this huge transitional time? And so uh, we're, we're going to work on that, but it's, it's quite a challenge. Absolutely, and and ending at, at 1945, and that epilogue is is really so telling. It's it's almost seeming like uh, the the gains that women had made over the the course of World War II and really up through the 20s and 30s, they they almost reset uh, and have to to fight those fights all over again. Pretty much, pretty much. I mean, they they had access, and uh, but you know the uh, uh, equality uh, and uh, the expectations for women. You know, they just they just weren't there, and uh, a, a lot more women uh, did a you know made a, a valiant effort to keep that moving, you know, and push for uh, uh, better better conditions for women. And we still do today, actually, even though we have a majority of women students. I wonder if, if both y'all would would maybe reflect on you know who the women were who were attending UK. Um, where do they come from geographically within the state? Um, you know, where are they, or, you know, relatively in class? How does that, how do those dynamics change over time? I noticed um, in, in Deirdre's section, there were a lot of core inner bluegrass last names that, uh, that, that popped. And then I noticed increasingly, we seem to have a greater geographical spread through the presentation. I wonder if that held throughout the, the student body. Well, the, the, uh, early women, uh, were primarily from, from central Kentucky. And, you know, you see the Breckenridges and the Kincaids and the, uh, the uh, names that uh, people in Lexington are, are very familiar with. Uh, one of the things that since, you know, we worked on this project so long and, and I, the access to information got better and better as we were working on the book. And so it became possible later on through access to newspapers.com and ancestry.com to do a little better uh, research on who these individual women were. And so what initially I thought it was primarily um, upper middle to upper class women whose uh, families were sending them to UK, you know, uh, but I was uh, very surprised, happily surprised to learn 
that uh, a large percentage of the early women students uh, were daughters of shopkeepers and uh, uh, middle-class uh, families who saw public education as a way for their daughters to, to become, uh, to get a college degree and primarily to become teachers, you know? So, uh, and then over time, as you said, uh, Patrick, uh, as uh, places to, you know, as Deirdre said, they didn't have a place to live for a quarter of a century. So once that, once that happened, uh, uh, you know, people could uh, send their daughters and, and feel pretty, pretty good about it. And Deirdre, uh, you know, did some research on the boarding houses that, that, that they had at even before, uh, even before uh, Patterson Hall, where they, the men and women were living together. I guess the university didn't realize it at that time. <laughs> Not in the same room. They were in the same boarding house, as far as I know. Well, it's fascinating to think about the, the campus developing and, and, you know, then the, the entire educational landscape across the, the country is developing at this time, you know, over this, this, uh, this span that you all were talking about. I wonder, um, what's the trajectory of, of women at other, you know, regional universities, other Kentucky colleges, maybe some private ones as well as the state ones? Do they, are, the, are women um, admitted as early? Are they, are they there as uh, in as, as large a numbers at this time, or is the, is being a state university something unique? Uh, UK uh, was the first public, but well, it was the first uh, uh, college university in Kentucky to admit women. Uh, Transylvania, you know, they had Hamilton College, and they later admitted women. Georgetown later admitted women. In, in 1906, uh, the state created two normal schools, teacher training schools, uh, which became Eastern and uh, Western Kentucky universities. And uh, they were co-ed from the, from the beginning. Uh, in the book, we make a list of uh, schools, uh, basically in the Southeastern Conference in the South and show the comparison in terms of the years that UK uh, opened up and, and the others did. And UK was uh, fairly early in that. Uh, and of course, out West, the Western universities uh, admitted women earlier than uh, some of the other places. But on a national level, just to you know, throw out something on the other end of the spectrum, um, I, I think that the last public institution to co-educate, it was in Virginia, and that was in the 1970s. So it really, um, spans that timeline, you know, from the 1800s through what we would consider as, you know, our much more recent past. That's right. You know, in the states where they had uh, developed a public woman's college, you know, that like North Carolina and Virginia, uh, that uh, that change came came later. You know, interestingly to me, uh, uh, Otis Singletary, longtime president of the University of Kentucky. His presidency, his first presidency was the Women's College of North Carolina, which uh, ended up being, is now the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. We've had uh, one person write in and, and ask for you to repeat the, the name of Happy Chandler's high school teacher. Rexy Raymond, R-E-X-I-E-R-A-Y-M-O-N-D. Fantastic. We got uh, we got uh, some more research going to happen there. Yeah, somebody's checking checking on my research. <laughs> <laughs> That's so there's another story to be told there. There always is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, was, that was incredible. Um, all right. Well, um, we've got a few minutes left. I wonder if we could. I, I've really loved all of these images in the presentation. I wondered if if you all could pick a, a favorite or two and and talk about why it's the one that you you absolutely love. Well, Terry's not going to be surprised that, and it may be your favorite too. I don't know. Margaret Ingalls, the cover, um, you know, Terry and I both served as university archivists at some point um, in our careers at UK libraries. And, you know, so we both have a, um, a great interest in 
university history, and I think we both at different times became enamored with the Margaret Ingalls collection. And I just, you know, that image of Margaret Ingalls is just so strong and it's so early and um, just seeing her in this, you know, field that is still traditionally dominated by men, you know, that really hasn't changed. And to see her presence just, just be such a force, um, I just, I love that. And she has other um, images in her, her personal papers that are at special collections of her friends and some of the, uh, you know, things that they did. And um, one of the things that struck me with her set of papers and her female friends, and she had, you know, uh, friends that were men and women, but the women, um, it's where I noticed they start wearing pants instead of dresses. And so just sort of general, in general, her collection is one that's really special to me. And um, I think Terry has some other aspects in that collection that he likes too, but I'll let him speak for himself. Oh, no, that, that, that's our favorite photograph. And we were so pleased that the University Press did use that for the cover, but we were we were worried we wanted that on there. And then of course the woman on the back is uh, Margaret McLaughlin. And she was another, you know, we, in preparing for the, this presentation, I, I just kept thinking, gosh, I wish I could tell them about so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. You know, there's just so many really uh, fascinating women in this in this story. And uh, uh, the other picture I like about the Margaret Ingalls is she's in, wearing her pants out playing golf, you know, so, uh, but uh, yeah, it uh, there there are so many so many images that come to mind uh, from this. But you know, Deirdre talked about when uh, when Bell Gunn you know was going to receive her degree, and and this uh, Louisville newspaper correspondent, all he could write about was what she looked like, you know, and and in very creepy ways, and uh, if I might say so, and. And with Margaret Ingalls, that uh, uh, a, a, a reporter came out to interview her, you know, about her engineering work, and and all he could talk about was her strong arms and this and that and her dainty this, you know. It was just, it's just, you know, it's so much part of the story, and so you know, you it's nice that Deirdre was able to pick out these photographs that show these strong women, you know, not being defined by somebody uh, about their physicality, you know, but it's their, it's their intellect and uh, their determination to, to succeed that really draw you to these women. I think that's a, a fantastic place for up to, us to wrap up. I would point out to our audience that we do have Terry and Deirdre's email addresses in the chat. If you do have any follow-up questions, uh, definitely do email them. Uh, go check out a lot of these collections on Explore UK um, and, and follow this story. And again, remember, we've got that, uh, that discount code for uh, the book uh, through UPK. Thank you both so much for this. I've really enjoyed this indulgent hour with my alma mater. Well, thank you, Patrick. And thank everyone for uh, joining us this evening. We very appreciate it. All right. Everybody have a good night. Bye-bye.